muted. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome everyone to becoming a call center compliance guru and increasing performance by 50%. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. I'd like to welcome today's presenters. First, we have Carl Coster, Noble IP and Regulatory Counsel, and Ken DeMille, our Regional Director for Noble Systems West Coast. Ken, you may now begin your webinar. Well, good morning, everybody. This is Ken DeMille with Noble Systems. Before we commence, I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to participate today. To set the stage, the primary goal of this webinar is to be educational with a focus on the compliance and regulatory policies that can impact the following areas. Workforce management adherence, data analytics, and speech analytics, which my colleague Carl Koster will discuss with you today. But before we embark on this journey, I want to take you through a overview of who Noble Systems is, so you have a point of reference should we want, you want to pursue discussions on today's uh, presentation topics. Next slide, please. Thank you. So to begin, Noble Systems is a, I'm sorry, thank you. Noble Systems is an industry leader. We've been around actually since 1989. Our first product release came out in 1986. And we have over 100 patents to our credit and growing. Secondly, Noble Systems is a very tenured company. We've been in practice for over 27 years with the same senior management and the average tenure of, of a Noble Systems employee is six years, and we continue to have year after year growth and profitability. We're a global company serving over 4,000 clients in 30 different countries in over six continents. Fourthly, we're a customer-centric culture. We have over 2,500 users, group, group members, with uh, comprised of <clears throat> multiple different market verticals. We have an annual group conference held globally where we promote best practices and deliver roadmap uh, information. We also have a quarterly meeting, which I'll discuss later on, where we have select members that um, meet with our management groups to help us stay on top of their needs and demands in their industries and help to uh, govern um, future uh, product releases and, and applications. We are continually recipient, recipient of, as a award-winning company of many of the industry uh, trackers and uh, monitors. And finally, we are dedicated to total contact center application development as a global provider. Next slide, please. Noble Systems is comprised of many different elements. Make up for an end can provide an end to end solution for all contact center requirements as well as PBX functionality. Beginning with a robust and fully blended inbound and outbound omni channel capability, workforce management, workforce optimization, call recording, IVR, speech analytics, data analytics, and PBX functionality. We can deliver these applications via premise, cloud, or in, or in hybrid combination designed with the same programming code with the capacity to interoperate with multiple PBX manufacturers and communication systems. Next slide, please. So Noble Systems is a partner choice for many multiple uh, uh, business sectors. We work with six of the ten largest cable companies in the United States, including Comcast. We have four of the largest student loan contractors. We work with five of the world's top ten banks for campaign management analytics, including Bank of America, Chase Manhattan, and Citibank, to name a few. We work with the leading global brick and mortar uh, on online retail providers from Nordstrom's to Cabela's and others. And we work with the leading vacation ownership firms and logistic firms from Hertz to Marriott Hotels. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. As I had mentioned earlier, 
We are very customer-centric focused. This slide represents the customers as part of the Noble SNAP program. SNAP stands for Select Noble Advisory Council. Each quarter, we meet with our SNAP members to, with, uh, and along with Noble executives and technical teams to discuss relevant applications and compliance issues with the objective of maintaining success aligned with their particular industry demands. And I believe this concludes my portion of the presentation. I'm going to now hand off to my colleague, Carl. Well, thank you, Ken. Uh, my name is Carl Koster. Uh, the purpose of this webinar is to focus on how technology that keeps you complying can also increase your productivity. Um, I continually read about lawsuits or settlements of firms that uh, are alleged to be in noncompliance. And each time I read that, I think of that this could be avoided or minimized by using appropriate compliance technology. In many cases, the operators are using obsolete technology. And I think part of that might be that it's difficult to justify the benefit of using compliance technology, that is, until you've been sued and have to pay damages or a fine. But many times when you deploy the, that compliance technology, there are productivity gains that can be real. And those productivity gains are often very measurable and hit the bottom line in a positive way. And yes, in some cases, the productivity figures that I'll go over with you uh, will exceed 50%. Uh, obviously, it depends on each call center's uh, particular situation as to what kind of uplift can be achieved, but I'll provide some examples that we've we found. So my goal is for you to understand, at least for these three cases, how the technology that can make you compliant can also increase your productivity. So let's get started. Let's talk about workforce management first. And in each case, we're going to talk about what it is, why we need it, and how it works. Uh, from a background perspective, just in case someone's not familiar with workforce management technology, it's there are systems that are designed to examine your call history, your outbound dialing go goals, and forecast how many agents are needed to accomplish the task at hand. So that's one part of it. The other part is to take uh, your existing workforce and schedule them in an optimal manner in order to meet the forecasted needs. Now, even if you have um, uh, 50 or more agents, you can benefit from using a, a workforce management tool. And in addition to forecasting and scheduling, the WFM can also be used to more accurately track agents' work time in various situations. We're going to go over a couple of those. In order to do this, it may require that the WFM is coupled or integrated with a call handler. And if this uh, occurs, there are additional benefits that can be achieved from a productivity perspective. Okay, let's look at the compliance, one compliance requirement as to why we need to accurately measure uh, agents' work time. A few years ago, the Department of Labor identified various ways that employers can be held liable if they will withhold compensation for agents uh, for performing job-related tasks. Um, these include, for example, uh, agents having to boot up their computers, open up applications, downloading uh, daily work instructions or campaign instructions, reading and reviewing or writing work-related emails, and then correspondingly at the end of their shift, shutting down their computers and logging off. All that is considered work time, and those tasks have to be included in the, in the work time that the agent's compensated for. So that gives us a background of one of the compliance requirements. Um, so the goal is to accurately measure the agent's work time. And that's a little bit of a dilemma. Um, we typically, in some contact center operators, err on the side of over-reporting agent time. And basically, they may use uh, obsolete technology such as time clocks or uh, quite frequently, a supervisor that manually records on a spreadsheet whether they came in and when they came in. That has a tendency of over-reporting the agent work time. Um, it's possible that the agent actually is not working, but they're being paid. 
and obviously contact center operators are moving away from this type of approach but the danger is that they're going to err on the other side and that is under reporting the agent work time uh, for example they may inadvertently exclude the time that it takes the agent to log in or log out and that raises a compliance issue as we just learned if that occurs the operator may be under uh, may be involved in a wage theft class action lawsuit now what's a wage theft class action lawsuit well it's an allegation that the agent hasn't been paid for time work and as we just learned um, the time that an agent spends logging in um, reading emails and so forth has to be accommodated some other ways that a wage theft uh, lawsuit may involve uh, inaccurate reporting of the agent working past uh, a schedule break uh, working past their schedule times and this actually occurs more often than you would think because many times the agent is going to be on a call and their break starts or their shift ends they're not going to hang up on the call they're going to continue the call how long it takes so they can wind up working into their schedule break or working past their schedule of uh, shift end that may be only a few minutes you think and that's maybe not a concern but the damages are real um, the wage theft loft suits are on the rise and the, one of the reasons is that if there's an agent who can demonstrate that they've not been paid for their working time the plaintiff's attorney is going to be smart enough and know that there are likely other agents in the same situation so if you have a problem with one agent you may have a problem with all the agents and the five or ten minutes that an agent is spend spending working past their shift or into their breaks um, if you take that fraction of an hour and multiply it by the agent's salary take that figure and multiply it by let's say five days a week take that figure multiply it by 50 weeks per year take that figure multiply it for three years that's how far damages can be collected now take that figure multiply it by the number of agents in your call center now you can appreciate why many of these settlements are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars range or higher in the millions of dollars range these few minutes add up significantly so we have a motivation to accurately measure uh, work time let me focus on one example um, the agent has a, a break uh, maybe a mid-morning rest break at 10 a.m. Uh, they're on a call they're going to continue working that call until let's say 10 uh, at that point if they return at 10 10 from their rest break uh, they've been shortchanged two minutes on their rest break what should happen is they should take an extra two minutes to 10 12 we should adjust the break time however that can be difficult to measure and enforce so we're going to learn how to fix that um, a WFM is a great tool to schedule agent breaks that's long been the case that it will schedule agents to have the appropriate rest breaks in their various state and federal laws that may be applicable as to how often uh, breaks are supposed to be provided to agents um, for example 10 minutes in a four-hour shift 30 minute lunch break if the shift is more than five hours um, the operator may have different policies um, ensuring that agents have an adequate break there's a brute force method which I've seen uh, operators use and that is simply schedule all the agents at the same time now how and when you schedule the breaks um, is not so much uh, it, there is a compliance aspect but there's also a productivity aspect if you were to do the brute force approach and schedule everyone for the same time for example everyone takes a break from 10 to 10 10 and from in this case an hour or 12 to 1 um, that's going to have an adverse impact if you're an inbound call center you won't have agents available to handle the call so obviously we wouldn't do that on the other hand uh, some outbound call centers uh, do this however there's some adverse impacts with respect to some other technologies we're going to talk about such as best time to call technologies these may be optimal times to reach certain callers 
So not having agent, agents can have an adverse impact in that respect. The solution isn't difficult. We know that we can stagger the start times of the shifts from 8 to 9 and in between and correspondingly stagger the mid-morning breaks and correspondingly stagger the lunch breaks. And that has the result of essentially smoothing out the available resources so we don't have those big gaps. Now, this isn't new, but what is new is the challenge of scheduling the breaks and the start times to in an optimal manner. Typically, many operators we're finding out do this on an ad hoc basis. Um, first of all, if you try to do it ad hoc manually, it's, it's difficult, it becomes rapidly very difficult to do. When you have 50 or more agents, it, it becomes time consuming. Uh, there's really no practical way to measure if those agents are taking their breaks when they're supposed to. And it's impossible to optimize on an ad hoc basis, um, pen and paper or a spreadsheet. And, and that's because optimizing when those breaks occur requires analyzing historical traffic patterns, agent shrinkage, um, applying various algorithms that you just can't do with pen and paper. So a WFM is a great tool to do that. Now let's look at one particular optimization tool that a WFM can do with respect to these breaks. It's called forced adherence. And that is, if the agent is scheduled to take the break from 10 to 1010, and they do work into their break, they should have their break adjusted, as we learned, to 1012. Forced adherence can integrate the WFM with the call handler so that the agent isn't allowed to log in at 1010. Basically, they're forced to take their entire break. And prior to the ending of their break, they can be notified through a, a message or text or some other way that it's time to resume. But with the WFM integrated to the call handler, we can ensure that agents take their breaks when they're supposed to and they don't take less and we know when they take more than they're supposed to. The point that I want to emphasize is that a WFM can accurately measure agent work time more so than just the call handler. And it can be used to schedule, uh, enforce the scheduled break times and work times with a much higher degree than it's possible with a time clock or just the call handler. Uh, furthermore, the WFM can optimize the schedule breaks. It can define exactly to the minute what's the best way to schedule these start times and the breaks to meet the anticipated load. Now, if you were to do this, just staggering the break time, we have seen, this is one case, a four, over 4% 4 increase in service levels, just by staggering them in an optimal manner, uh, with a corresponding 2% reduction in abandoned call rates. Now, 2% isn't earth-shaking, but this particular application was a hotel reservation call center. So reducing 2% abandoned calls translated into a lot of revenue that they were able to recapture. Furthermore, it avoided four and a half hours of time having to manually schedule and stagger the break times and the corresponding changes during the week. So right there, that's not a trivial uh, savings. What was significant and somewhat surprising is the fact that depending on the contact center environment, if you tell the agents, we, are now, we now have a tool to actually accurately track when you're going to be taking your breaks, when you're going to be working, uh, we'll know if you're uh, leaving early or so forth. Uh, we have seen 15 to 25% increases in agent work time. Uh, one newspaper call center that I worked with uh, reported a 20% increase after they deployed this. And uh, to an extent, it may reflect that maybe they weren't as disciplined or aware as they could have, but this was a great compliance tool that showed them how to accurately track time, and they had a non-trivial increase in productivity. So that's case study number one. Let's go to case study, case study number two. 
outbound call analytics. It's a little bit more complicated, so I'm going to spend a little bit more time explaining uh, why we need it and how it works. Okay, why do we need this? What we're finding out is more and more large enterprise customers internally are deciding they need to track and control call attempts to their clients. I'll give you an example for, of a credit union um, or bank. Uh, they may have a personal loan department, an auto loan department, a car loan department, a home mortgage division. They, they may have credit cards. So they had savings accounts, checking accounts. And they're finding out that each of these business lines of business are silos that are calling the same customer independently. And they're recognizing they have to control and track call attempts. There's a strong regulatory pressure to limit call attempts, particularly in the debt collection space. There are a number of state, federal proposed regulations that require accurately tracking and limiting the number of call attempts. And uh, this is a, could be a fast way to do a lawsuit if you violate uh, those limits. The result is that if you do that, you're going to have better customer service. You're going to appear, for example, coordinated to your customer, and your customer won't be harassed by receiving multiple calls from, from different business units from the same enterprise. More importantly, you're going to have better utilization of resources. If you employ outbound call data analytics, you're going to have your agents spending their time talking to people that have been reached as opposed to waiting for the dialer to reach those people. The reason we need outbound call analytics more so today is that we can't just hammer the list calling it each number 10 times a day. We used to be able to do that in the past. If you could do that, there would be no need for a best time to call algorithm because you're calling them all the time. You'll, you will reach the person. However, because we can't do that, because we're limited to uh, the number of times we can try, we have to make sure that we're calling in a and in an intelligent manner. We have to have smarts about this. Now, how outbound call analytics works, it's, it's much different from some of the prior versions of best time to call. Um, some of the early versions of best time to call, to give you an example, uh, we would have history of calling John Doe. We know we reached John Doe on a Monday morning, so let's call John Doe on Monday mornings. Um, that doesn't work if John Doe is a new customer and you don't have a calling history. What today's data analytics does is a lot more sophisticated. It will say John Doe is like this subset of customers that we have been calling. And we have the call history for those other customers. We know when we were able to contact them, obtaining a right party contact. And further, we have disposition status for those calls, so we know when we were able to obtain a desirable outcome for that contact. And by modeling Joe, John Doe as a particular subset of your call history, we can mine that call history to know when is the best time to call John Doe and when's the best time to get a desirable outcome, even though we've never contacted John Doe before. That's what's surprising. You don't have to have call history for John Doe. Furthermore, your call history doesn't have to be years and years. It only has to be maybe two or three months. And if you have more than 50 agents making outbound calls, you probably have enough call history to benefit from using outbound call data analytics. The result is that your agents are going to be better utilized because you're making fewer call attempts to reach these people. Now, the model is based on variables for your particular business. Um, and that depends on, you know, if you're a credit card company, uh, you will have a set of variables that you'll be using to that you characterize your customers, FICO scores, uh, uh, average daily balance, uh, amount past due. If you're an automobile finance company, uh, you will have, for example, the number of months of the loan, the uh, down payment made, the type of car uh, that the, was purchased. Those variables that you have have useful data in them. You just have to mine them. 
And if you want, you can supplement that by getting external data, but typically you have sufficient data that you can get a benefit just by using that. Now, I'll try to explain how it works. Typically, you have a dialing list that you would load into your dialer each day. And you're going to call those people in the order that they appear in the dialing list. Guess what? Most of the time, that dialing list is ordered in a random fashion. So you're going to be dialing those people in a random order. There's no intelligence whatsoever in dialing. Now, some large banks and enterprises do have staffs of PhD in statistics. And the PhDs will try to organize this list in an optimal manner. Most of us don't have a staff of PhDs that are focused on optimizing the styling list. What outbound call data analytics can do, one approach, is to take this list, replicate it 16 times, once for each hour of operation of the contact center. So if the operation is from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. coast to coast, we have 16 hours. We'll have 16 replicated lists, but each hour's list is ordered in the priority for that hour. So for example, in the morning hour of 8, 8 to 9 a.m., this first record is the blue one, is the highest priority, the best likelihood of achieving contact. Later in the day, it's the worst. So this gets reorganized every hour, and every hour it's downloaded to the dialer. So each hour, the dialer is starting anew, dialing the same list of contacts in a prioritized order. Now, if we happen to reach this blue record in the first hour, we'll flag it so we don't contact that record again in the subsequent hours of the day. So by this approach, we're adding some intelligence as opposed to random dialing. Now, this can also be applied for wireless lists. And it's even more beneficial. Why? Because as we all know, manual dialing of wireless numbers due to the TCPA is less efficient than using a predictive dialer. It takes more time. So the more time we have to take in dialing a number, the more important it is to have an intelligent dialing scheme. So we can do the same thing, taking the list of wireless numbers, replicating them, ordering them, and then sending it to the Maya manual dialing system on an hourly basis. To recap, the process looks something like this. Each morning, you'll have a calling list. You may scrub it today to determine which are wireline numbers and which are wireless numbers. Rather than providing those numbers directly to the infrastructure, the dialers, we're going to pass them to a data analytics processor, which gen generates the 16 lists and sends them on an hourly basis to the infrastructure for dialing. So if you apply this kind of intelligent ordering of a calling list, you'll be surprised at what you find out. First of all, you will have increased productivity. You will find out that you are contacting more people. You're going to have more right party contacts uh, with your agent workforce than you would otherwise. Um, as I said, it can be applied to wireline or wireless. In, a, in addition, you can also apply the predictive modeling to determine for a particular customer, should you dial their wireline number or their wireless number? Frequently, we have both numbers in our account data, and many people just define a rule, always dial the wireline number or always dial the wireless number. Uh, there's no intelligence as to maybe one would be better than the other certain times of the day. So the model can be applied for that as well. Finally, if you do apply this kind of intelligent dialing, and you do have a group of PhD statisticians, you might receive an uplift of maybe 15% or 20% in right party contacts. Chances are you don't have that kind of a staff, uh, and you're going to see a larger increase. And 30 to 50 percent increase in right party contacts is not uncommon. I will say that we have many instances where the increases are greater than that. Um, but when I start putting down some of those figures, it just seems like a blatant exaggeration. But we've had phenomenal increases. And that's because what we're doing is we're, we're improving it from just a random dial 
to some sort of intelligent uh, dialing strategy. And so it's not surprising we're going to get a 50 or greater percent increase. Well, so there, I've met at least my requirement of showing you how you can increase productivity by 50%. It was not an exaggeration. Okay, let's go to the last study. Uh, speech analytics, what it does, why it's needed, and how it works. Okay, first of all, speech analytics, it's not your grandfather's speech recognition. Speech analytics is a lot more sophisticated. Speech recognition tells you if, for example, the word yes was said in a conversation. You don't know if the word yes was said in response to, are you having a good day? Or said in response to, do I have your consent to dial your wireless number? One is not important at all. The other one is critically important. So we want to be able to analyze the context. What that means is we analyze the agent's speech in a separate audio stream from the remote party. So we clearly know who is saying what when, and we can determine the context. So we know when they say yes, it's in respond to consent to dialing a wireless number. We don't care if it's yes, you're having a nice day. The other factor that um, you should be aware of is that speech analytics can be applied real time or non real time. Real time as the name implies, means that it analyzes the speech during the call and it allows us to provide feedback to the agent for that call. So it allows us to provide real-time coaching, real-time indications, real-time notifications to supervisors that something isn't happening properly. Um, in addition, we can perform speech analytics on a non-real-time basis, and that's analyzing call recordings. That can be immediately after the call is done or more frequently at the end of the shift, at the end of the day, all recordings are processed. We can still detect the same conditions. We just can't obviously coach the agent in real time because the call is over. The way it works is a set of keywords indicative of a desired condition are defined. So we'll define an initial set of keywords we wanted to detect. Um, Typically, as you get experience with this, you will modify it, and you define what particular application, uh, what risk or condition you want to detect and ameliorate. Um, a great example is debt collection calls have a certain cadence. Um, the agent has to verify who they're speaking with. They have to provide them a mini Miranda, so to speak. Um, th this call is for collecting a debt. Uh, they have to confirm the amount that's due. If the debtor says uh, they are in bankruptcy, uh, then the agent is, has to cease collection efforts. Typically, the agent is taught to ask for the uh, debtor's attorney. So these are the kind of things you can look out for. And as you gain more experience, you'd learn that, well, you may want to detect when the agent says uh, attorney as well as lawyer. You may want to detect when the debtor says bankruptcy as well as bankrupt, as well as Chapter 11. Those are all indicative of the same condition. Once you identify these keywords, you can process it, um, process the calls to identify those keywords, real time or non-real time, and then you can check for appropriate response. Let me give you a real life example. This is the compliance requirement. TCPA requires consent to dial the wireless number, and the person can revoke it at any time. Typically, uh, this may occur when the, when the called party is speaking with the agent. They may tell the agent they're revoking consent. There is a concern in this situation, and the reason is agents are human. The agent may be new. The agent may not recognize the importance of, of this uh, bit of information. Agent may be unfocused at the moment. They just may have a bad day. Even if the agent is trained and focused, there are examples where verbiage is used that, that is not clear. And we can't expect an agent to have appropriate judgment because uh, sometimes lawyers can spend hours debating whether or not the request was adequate revocation of consent. So 
so we may want to verify and validate these uh, offline. Let me give you an example of an auto finance company of how they use this. They purchased the technology for compliance, and one of the applications was detecting revocation of consent. So they defined the keywords to detect all calls where the person revoked consent. They would then identify those calls at the end of the day, and they would check to see whether those calls had the accounts flagged as having consent revoked. If there was a discrepancy, the compliance officer would manually review those calls and determine whether or not they were coded correctly. The result of this is they virtually eliminated revocation requests that fell through the cracks. They virtually eliminated the risk of a class action on this particular topic. They had defensible data if they were going to be sued because chances are um, the allegation couldn't be proved. They had data to show otherwise. So this was a great example of how speech analytics can be used to <coughs> um, meet a compliance requirement. Let's view how, how speech analytics can help you on the productivity front. Many contact centers dedicate <coughs> a portion of the agent's time for quality assurance. And this requires listening to calls and scoring them. And typically, less than 1% of the agent's calls are scored. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, consequently, we can largely eliminate that manual scoring by using speech analytics. And not only that, we can score 100% of the calls. The result is that if there's an agent who's not performing properly, we can identify that agent very quickly. We can identify what training they need very quickly. You don't have the situation where an agent, a new agent, is making mistakes for three months before you discover, oh my gosh, we haven't been saying the many Miranda on all the calls. Uh, you would find out right away. You could train the agent right away. Chances are the agent's going to change their behavior much quicker rather than having developed a bad habit. They're going to get it right sooner. Now, let me give you two brief case studies of how other people have used speech analytics to um, improve their bottom line. This involved an owner of a debt collection agency. And he was convinced that his agents uh, properly collected uh, debts and they were always uh, doing the right thing and they they were and he said they're as effective as they could be and when we asked well do your agents actually ask the debtor for a payment well, of course they do he responded that's what debt collecting agents do well the application of speech analytics uh, yielded a very surprising result he found out 40 percent 40 percent of the time Agents did not ask the debtor for a payment. Now, that's what they're supposed to do. So deploying this technology, he informed the agents that this, the proper behavior is to ask the debtor for a payment. We will monitor you. We will detect it. The agents properly started asking for payment. And guess what? Collections increased. I wish I could tell you how much they did increase. I don't have that information available to me but it wasn't, was not insignificant. Let me return another example to the uh, auto finance company. Uh, they bought the, the uh, technology for uh, compliance purposes, and the compliance officer was thinking, how can I use it to make money? Well, they had a script defined that was an optional script that allowed agents to discount the amount due of the loan based on certain conditions, and there was a small, medium, and large discount. Now, upon reviewing the recording, she found out some agents never did this, which was not correct. Um, it would have been better to get something rather than nothing. Other agents, she found out, always jumped to the maximum discount right away. It was inappropriate to do that because it wasn't necessary. 
So she uh, deployed this technology, informed the agents uh, what the proper, proper use of the script was. She indicated you have uh, two weeks, uh, and thereafter we're going to start monitoring you, and uh, we want you to use it properly. Well, the agents, as expected, started to use the script properly, and guess what? Collections increased. She was able to go to her board of directors and basically say, look, the money you spent on compliance technology, I figured out how to make us more money. It was a win-win situation. She looked good. She was happy. The board of directors was happy they were collecting more money. I'm sure you're going to want to learn more about win-win situations by using compliance technology to make more uh, higher productivity gains. And to that extent, I would ask that you contact Ken DeMille, and he'll be happy to provide you further information on how you can maintain compliance and increase productivity. With that, um, there are a couple questions that were submitted that I want to address. One is, um, I'll read this out briefly. We're based in California, but deal with customers nationally. We have a message on the IVR that states calls may be recorded for quality and training purposes. I want to be sure that since I think we are in a dual consent state, that there's nothing else we must do to obtain caller consent to be recorded. And I'll have to preface by saying um, I can't provide you legal guidance on your factual situation, but I'll provide you some general information regarding it. California is a dual consent state. That means that both parties on the call have to consent uh, to be recorded. More accurately, it's an all-party consent, consent state, meaning if you have more than two parties, all of them have to consent. So that's something to keep in mind if you have a conferencing arrangement. There are cases in California that have held that a beep, the re recurring beep, is a sufficient notice of call recording. <coughs> Furthermore, there are other cases that have held that once the party is has been notified that the call is recording, that if they choose to voluntarily continue on the call, that's considered implicit consent. So I think an explicit message would likely serve as a notification. And if they stay on the call, then that could be implied consent. But be aware, there's always uh, the got you's. If you've got, for example, dual language IVR menus, make sure that you provide the notification in both languages. If you have a um, situation where, and we've seen this, where uh, if the IVR is taken out of service or there's a problem, there may be a backup routing mechanism defined, which doesn't have that announcement. <coughs> um, other problems we've seen is when the operator uh, accidentally replaces the IVR message with a greeting that doesn't have uh, notification. So there's still things you have to watch out for. Um, another message, uh, another question was, um, I'm hearing conflicting advice from different legal factions regarding TCPA compliance and whether or not click to dial is a defensible alternative to using human fingers to dial. What is your position? I love this question because this is a uh, point that I've been trying to make to people and slightly different persp uh, perspective. Um, not all click to dial solutions are the same. <clears throat> they all have a similar user interface in that the agent is clicking something, but what's behind the scenes is very different. And there are some which are very risky, some which I think are low risk. In all these um, cases, the, op the uh, operator de relies on a um, human intervention defense. And the FCC said that human intervention is characteristic of a manually dialed call. It's not an auto dialed call, but it's not a definitive test. And bear in mind, the Santander case in 2013 was an agent using a predictive dialer in preview mode. And I don't think the human intervention defense would work today very well in that case. Let me show you a low risk approach. 
we have a compliance server that stores the number and it will present it to an agent on their computer screen, web browser or a client, thin or thick client application. The agent then copies that number from their browser into a soft phone application. That's what this little colored box is. It's a window for a soft phone. It could be a hard phone, separate hard phone. Then they dial, hit the send key, and that call is originated to a voice switch, which then originates the call to a wireless number. This case, the number, the equipment that stores the number is separate from the equipment that dials the number. You can argue that we're using a phone to originate the call. So at least that's, I think, a defense. The equipment that stores the number to be dialed is distinct and separate from the equipment that handles the call. Now here's another solution that I think has higher risk. There's a dial server that stores the number, but also has application processing that causes the call to originate. It causes the number to be presented on the agent's screen, and the agent hits a function key, not on the soft phone, but on the application that causes a command to be sent to the dial server that says, dial that number you just presented to me. It's not a phone call initiation. The dial server then sends the number to a telephony device, causing it to send, originate the call. In this case, there is no telephone that originates the call. In this case, I think it's a higher risk, even though it may look like a click to dial on the user interface. So the concern is if that the equipment that stores the number then dials the number, that combination may be viewed as an auto dialer. I think a preferable solution is to uh, provide the number using a phone device of some sort that dials the number and it uses equipment that doesn't store the number prior to dialing. Uh, with that, I want to thank you very much for your time. Uh, we're nearing the end of our presentation. I would like to inform you that we are planning another webinar later this summer addressing the, F the DC Circuit ruling uh, regarding the appeal of the FCC's 2015 TCPA order. Uh, that certainly is going to have a lot of impact to the industry. Once that order is issued, we'll be able to schedule that. Um, obviously, we don't know until it's issued. And we will send you notifications and look forward to hearing you at that time. Thank you very much. And this webinar is concluded.